Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have my friend Steve Chapel, Chapel Guide Service and Zero Hunt Fees, Elk Camp TV, uh, Mr. Elk Extraordinaire on the line, Steve Chapel. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing real good, Jay. Thanks for having me on today. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, you know, the last time we talked, I think it was you were just um, getting ready to head down there to Arizona. And you've had kind of a marathon run. Uh, I, I know you just got back, and um, you had a long archery hunt, a long um, early or muzzleloader hunt. Uh, how was it, uh, Steve, in, in general? Uh, how was the season? Yeah, Jay, um, to kind of put it in a phrase, let's just say we got the full experience on both of those hunts. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because, in general, it was pretty tough. I mean, you know, here and there we found little pockets here and there where there was some, you know, good rutting activity going on for a couple of days here and a couple of days there. But it, it seemed like outside of that, it was just a pretty tough year for, you know, good bugling and good calling and good interaction. Um, I had a lot of that, and it, it almost seems like our Arizona elk are a little bit conditioned, especially in certain areas. They do that famous gray light shutdown, which I'm sure you've experienced. You'll mm -hmm. you'll be real close to them. Uh, I shouldn't even say real close to them. You can be a half, three quarters of a mile away from them, not blowing a call, not putting any pressure on them whatsoever. And right there at very first gray light, when you would just think to start walking toward them, all of a sudden they stop bugling, and the next time you hear them bugle is about a mile away. And... It just seems like there's certain elk in certain areas that do that, and it seems to be a little more and more prevalent in my experience out there, and that makes it tough also. How much of that do you think is pressure-related, and they just, like you said, get conditioned to like, okay, it's time to make our move? How much of that is pressure? I have to think in my experience that it, it's mostly attributable to that. Um, yeah, they just seem to, right at that time when they would normally start having, you know, um, bad encounters with humans, you know, right there at that very first gray light when people are typically making a move on them is right when you notice that they shut down. And, I mean, they do. It's, sometimes it can be 20, 30 minutes before you hear them bugle again, and you just kind of have to assume that they're moving into the wind and generally that's what I'll do is just check the wind and kind of start marching into the wind and hoping that they'll chime up you know again that's the direction point. they're going with. You know, you know they're going that way, so you figure you'll just kind of chime right in there with them and fall in behind. Yeah, yeah, and nine times out of ten, that's true. And then what you hope for is that they'll start up again at some point. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And then it just leaves you, you hanging. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners have experienced that as well. And if you're in mountainous country, it always seems like they go up a steep, nasty hill <laughs> where there's a lot of blowdowns and things like that that can uh, create difficulty getting on them, too. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely challenging when you're dealing with elk like that. You know, Steve, you've spent a bunch of time in Arizona's Unit 9. This year you were in Arizona Unit 1. Um, what would you say, compare and contrast the two units, you know, everything from elk, numbers of elk, you know, miscellaneous people out and around, you know, country, bugling. Talk a little bit about the differences between nine and one. Yeah, they are definitely very different. The first thing for me that is very noticeable is that for the most part in nine, it's pretty much timbered. So in my opinion, you can't rule much of it out as far as hunting, and especially if you're a caller and you want to interact with the elk with, with calls in that way. Whereas in Unit 1, you have a lot of the unit that's just big, gigantic, wide-open meadows, and then you have pockets of thick timber around those big open meadows. And that, for me, doesn't really suit my style very well. So that was a challenge. And then you have, you know, quite a bit of the unit that's burned. And so, you know, that part of the unit is, is, is pretty open, and then, and then there's lots of blowdowns. And so, again, it creates challenges for calling. 
to get around. And then, of course, the elk can look and see you for long distances, so it's hard to get tight on them and call to them. So, um, you know, over the past few years, we've really liked Unit 1 just because of the bugling activity. It's normally really good. This year, uh, not so much so in general, I, I would say. Um, so, you know, if I had to pick and lean toward a unit on, on just a normal year, nine suits me better just because I feel like it's more of a caller's unit. Um, yeah. You know, with one, there's definitely the opportunity. I feel like if someone's a glasser, there's more glassing opportunity overall in unit one than there is in unit nine. Um, and then, of course, just the undeniable beauty of that unit with the white mountains and the high country, it's it's just spectacular in that in that way. Um, something that was very favorable, I thought, is really, Jay, there was only, throughout the whole archery and the whole muzzleloader hunt, there was only one day that I felt got affected by the wind. And normally, really? we're dealing with high winds quite frequently on these hunts, messing up, you know, uh, days of hunting. And, and really, it was only one day. I mean, we had some rains. Um, but not terrible with that either um, over there in the White Mountains. I think I think the uh, northwest part of the state got hit harder by that hurricane weather than we did. Um, yeah. So, you know, I really what can't about blame it on the What about people interaction, hunt, yeah. hunters in the field and, and that, um, you know, did you feel more pressure in one than you do in nine? Or, or uh, you know, going nine. into it, I, I didn't think that I would, but actually um, I did. There was a lot of activity in Unit 1, a lot of human activity. Um, you know, it was the same as in Unit 9 where you have a hunter with a tag and then you have several people out there scouting for that person. Everyone, everybody wants to be involved, which I totally get. Um, and then you just have recreationalists who are out there and don't even have any idea that there's hunts going on. And they're, you know, ripping around on their razors and rangers and stuff. And there was a couple of instances, Jay, where I'm telling you the timing could not have been worse. You know, we would have elk coming in about to seriously see him and get a, get a shot opportunity or a look at him. And all of a sudden, here would come a UTV Jeez. roaring up on some little two-track road. Have it, I mean, obviously no idea what was going on or that they right. were even hunting or anything. But, yeah, that was definitely a factor yeah, on the hunt. So something people need to know is a challenge out there. For sure, Steve. When you first got there, um, what was the rutting activity like and the bugling like before the season? Were they, were they cranked up early, or did it take them a while and even on into the season to even start bugling? Yeah, it was pretty slow when I first got there. Um, I got there on the 7th or 8th. I can't remember the exact day, but they weren't really going that well. And it just seemed like it was just a pretty slow progression into them getting going. And if I had to say, it seemed like the best bugling picked up right around, right around the full moon. Of course, it was fairly short-lived as far as length into the morning, but, you know, it was fairly intense. Yeah, for, you know, whatever amount of time that you had to interact with them. There was one particular pocket of elk um, that, uh, gosh, I just love these elk because they would only move about, let's say, half to three-quarters of a mile from where they fed in water to where they bedded, which was very mm -hmm. strange and unique for me. And they would stay there and just kind of beehive in that kind of middle ground and you could just go in and work one bull, go work another bull, and on and on. Um, they didn't track meet you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. or they take off and move miles and just leave you in the dust. Um, but then, unfortunately, that spot uh, kind of dried up on us. The elk moved out. Um, my archery hunter killed a bull in there, and I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, so then, you know, we weren't able to uh, enjoy that area as much on the muzzleloader hunt, unfortunately. <laughs> You mentioned again, uh, a lot of the unit being open in Unit 1, and I've seen a bunch on your Elk Camp TV uh, shows you using a decoy. Um, did you use the decoy, and did you feel like in some of that open country, did that decoy help you, hurt you? Um, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I did use it. I, I wouldn't say I used it as much as I've used it in the past, probably mainly because for the most part, I, I avoided those areas with just those, you know, miles and miles of open meadows. 
I can recall one scenario, though, where there was a bull with, I think, about five cows, and uh, one of the cows ended up inadvertently just coming up and almost walking into us and then busted and started barking. And so I snuck that decoy out and just took it out and put it out around the cedar tree we were behind. And when those elk saw that, it just completely changed their, their attitude and demeanor. Cow called a couple of times, and they just settled right back down. The bull went back to bugling. And when it got to be right there close to dark and they still had us pinned there, we just walked across in the wide open because we had no choice, and they stayed out there in the meadow as we as we walked across with that decoy in front of us. Steve, did you um, notice that the elk in Unit 1, were they more receptive to cow calling or bugling? I would have to say this year I definitely had more success cow calling versus where last year in Unit 9 I had quite a bit of success dealing with herd bulls with bugling. Um, I definitely did have more success this year with cow calling overall. Um, and it seemed like some of the bulls really liked, um, you know, the diaphragm call, blowing the mouth read cow call at them, and then others um, really jumped all over the open read. I just kind of had to test the waters a little bit and find out what they wanted to bite on, what they wanted to hear, and then stick with it. Across the state, um, your guides and other units and what have you, um, what has been the general consensus, uh, you know, overall on the Arizona elk season for 2018 so far? Yeah, uh, tough. I did have a guide who was guiding on the archery hunt nine. Sounded like the bugling was very hard to come by, very spotty. Um, had a hunter in seven west on that archery hunt which was a week behind um i think that one was a little better according to the guide because of the the week later start date on that um i think what we all struggled with was just consistently finding older age class bulls and that's something i really noticed in one was just how many you know of the two and a half and three and a half year old bulls there were and how many what I perceive to be three and a half year old bulls running harems. Um, I mean, I'm you know what's very on. interesting about that, um, Steve. Sorry to interrupt. What's interesting? I've talked yeah. with Chris Rowe and I've talked with um, Jeff Lester um, specifically, and they have brought up. Chris was in nine. Jeff was in one and twenty-seven. He was talking, I believe, about unit one, and he said, "I've never seen more." you know, those younger three-year-old type bulls, like, running the herd. Yeah. And Chris mentioned the same thing, that, you know, two- and three-year-old bulls just, you know, seemed like they were everywhere. But those, you know, six-, seven-, eight-year-old and older bulls, they're just the, the, the old, mature herd bulls were hard to come by. Very hard to come by. I mean, Jay, every time I'd get my hopes up, you know, when I'd start seeing cows, thinking, okay, here we here we got the Mac Daddy we're going to see here in just a minute. And then it'd be another sub-300 bull. I mean, on that muzzleloader hunt, <laughs> we got all the way down to the morning of the seventh day with me coming to grips with we may not tag a bull on this hunt because my hunter, you know, he was a true hunter in the respect that he didn't want to just shoot a bull to shoot a bull. He, he wasn't just going to kill an elk to kill an elk. So... I felt that pressure of him waiting over 20 years for his tag, you know, and then entrusting me with the hunt. And, I mean, it came all the way down to the last morning and what I felt was going to be our very last encounter that morning. And, you know, thank the Lord, it was a big, mature, probably five-and-a-half, six-and-a-half-year-old bull um, that, that we got on there and ultimately we, we tagged. So, uh, But prior to that, yeah, it was just a lot of frustration uh, over and over getting on elk and dealing with all these cows only to see another sub-300 bull running the show. Yeah, Steve, I want to take a quick second here and thank the sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, the gear shop. My friend Cody Nelson, the glassing guru, is the new optics manager at GoHunt.com gear shop. And if you guys have any optical needs at all, whether it be binos, uh, tripods, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, etc., you can give him a call directly. He will answer the phone at 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. Or you can email him at optics at gohunt.com. I'd also like to thank Kuyu. That's K-U-I-U dot com, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. 
and encourage you guys to go to their website, kuyu.com. Check out all of the great gear that Kuyu makes. Uh, if you guys follow along and, or have been following along, you obviously know that I use their gear and love their gear. And um, I, I th- want to thank them for their sponsorship, as well as canyoncoolers.com. If you use the J. Scott promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. Go to canyoncoolers.com, use the J. Scott promo code. And Phonescope, phonescope.com, that's um, Phonescope with a K. Uh, Phonescope, if you use the J. Scott promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount there at phonescope.com. Steve, uh, you know, you, you move from, you know, the archery hunt into the muzzleloader hunt. And if, if the archery hunt's kind of tough, you're always probably thinking, you know, uh, the, you know they're probably going to get going here on the muzzleloader hunt. Did the bugling intensity pick up, or was it pretty much the same as the archery hunt, just kind of hit or miss? Yeah, Jay, it remained the same. In fact, I would say that the length of the bugling in the mornings got shorter because of the full moon. And, mm-hmm. I mean, there were times where if that pocket of elk that you were sitting on in the darkness didn't do right for you, you know, when it got to be gray light and then shooting light, you were pretty much done because by the time you got yourself back to your vehicle, moved somewhere else, the same thing had happened elsewhere, and so you, it was over with for you. Um, so that, that made it real challenging having that short little window. And then, of course, in the evenings it would be the same way. They would wait to crank up until way late in the evening, so you felt very fortunate if you if you got on a single bull and had a single encounter in the evening. So I wow. just I started feeling very stressed um, about that again because you know you're entrusted with a with a tag with a hunter who's waited twenty some years for the tag and uh, you know you take ownership in that as a guide. I mean I'm sure you remember yeah. how that is. So oh yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. Looking forward with the um, late rifle hunt in Arizona, uh, considering somewhat of a lackluster rut, uh, one question I would ask you is, did you see many broken points in Unit 1, and did your guides report broken points? And that leads into my question of kind of the outlook for these either the late archery hunts or the late rifle hunts coming up uh, here uh, later in November and December. Just a little bit of your thoughts on one, broken bulls, two, you know, potentially, uh, you know, maybe second, third cycle rutting. Um, just what are your what are your overall thoughts there on those late hunts? Right. I, you know, I did see a few broken antlered bulls, and it seemed like, you know, they'd either be missing most of a beam or half of a beam type thing. And these, again, were these sub-300 bulls with cows. Um <laughs> So, yeah, exactly. So I think it could be difficult for people to, you know, glass up and find big, clean, mature bulls. I'm sure there will be some to be had. Um, you know, and, and I'm not di- I'm not ruling out that there could be some bugling, like especially on that late archery hunt, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, that would make that a much more enjoyable experience for those guys. But I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be the hardcore people or people who've got a lot of time to scout and glass that are going to have to look for that needle in a haystack to find, you know, the big, big mature unbroken bull. It's going to be no easy task. Yeah, definitely 2018 is going to go down as, you know, the 90, 96, the 2002, you know, yeah. um, the 06. It's definitely going to go down, wouldn't you agree, as, as one of those years that, you know, dang, it wasn't a good year at all. Yeah, well, when reality really hit me, Jay, is when uh, me and my muzzleloader hunter went to the meat processor and taxidermist with his bull, and, you know, I thought, maybe I'm just getting a little old and a little lame at this game, you know? I was really (laughs) doubting myself a little bit, you know, thinking my A game is, you know, turned into an F game or something, but this uh, (laughs) guy kind of reassured me there at the meat processor and taxidermist, he said, Steve, you would not believe, number one, the lack of animals that we have coming in, and then the amount of raghorns that are coming in from, yeah. you know, units 1 and 3C on these early rifle and muzzleloader hunts. He said, dude, this is, your bull is the best bull I've seen. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 No, so, I mean, it's, it's, 
it's always interesting to get the meat processor's perspective because they usually see a lot. And, yeah. you know, it's funny, you're in, you're in your own little bubble and, you know, thinking whatever you may be thinking, and then you realize, hey, we didn't stack up too bad. Um, I've had that happen several times where it's like, man, you kind of come in and kind of with your tail tucked between your legs a little bit, it's been a very tough yeah. hunt, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, okay, we, we actually did pretty darn good. Yeah. Steve, you're, um, you're on the cusp of uh, your Colorado uh, elk hunts. Uh, you and your dad have great Colorado elk hunting, um, and that starts this Saturday. What's your outlook uh, for your uh, hunts in Colorado, and are you going to be filming those as well for the Elk Camp TV? Yes, we will be filming those. Uh, my outlook for that is always good. It just seems like that herd over there, it's just kind of its own environment. So I expect them to be very vocal, just like they always are. I don't know yet about trophy quality just yet. Um, you know, I just got home last night, so I'm going to need to go over and do some glassing and check my trail camera that have been up there for about a month now and hope that they're still working and see what we got going on there. But as far as just quality of experience and quality of the hunt and just being around a lot of vocal elk, these these elk never disappoint me. So, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to push and reset and enjoying the next month or so with, with that herd. Yeah, I can tell you that the elk over here at the Ot 6 Ranch are still bugling really hard, and they're fighting and just carrying on and rutting like little rats out there for sure. It's It's been fun <laughs> watching them here. Um, Steve, I, I've talked to you on prior podcasts about uh, your Zero Hunt Fees program, uh, I want you to give uh, people, maybe this is their first episode hearing it, uh, talk a little bit about your Zero Hunt Fees program that, that you operate in Arizona. Yes, thank you, Jay. Um, yeah, basically the premise of it came about when the Arizona Game and Fish changed the draw in 2016, and you know now they issue half of the non-resident tags on a random basis and half on a point basis. So now it's very conceivable that non-residents can draw any tag on any given year. You know, not easy draw odds, but um, matter of fact, my archery hunter this year in Unit 1 had drawn Unit 9 in 2016, and he turned around and drew Unit 1 this year as a non-resident. He drew a random tag. Wow. So, wow. Uh, yeah, so, so um, the, the concept makes total sense now because of that. Uh, so what it is, it's a program where where people can pay $349 a year, and when they draw in Arizona, their hunt is totally covered at that point. So if a guy draws the very first year, which I had two members draw this year, that is correct. Their hunt's $349. Um, a lot of people so ask normally me, a hunt, many, you know, five, six, seven, eight grand, depending on what have you. Yeah. These, you had two this year that drew, and they paid, you know, basically 349 bucks, and they got a fully guided hunt. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the first question people will ask me is, well, okay, after I draw that first year, then how many years do I have to stay a member to pay off that hunt? And I tell them, you don't have to stay a member at all after that unless you choose to. If you keep applying in Arizona and want to continue your membership, you can certainly do that. But there is no minimum amount of years that you have to pay into it. So, you know, really it's kind of similar. In, uh, it's basically hunting insurance is like I, how I like to refer to it. Y you know, basically you just decide year to year is $349 this year worth it to me to hedge against the fact that if I draw a tag, I'm going to be looking at, say, a $6,000 guided hunt. And, yeah. You know, for people especially who could never conceive of going on a guided hunt because of the cost, it's so cost prohibit prohibitive, it really allows anyone who has the desire to come to Arizona and go on a quality hunt and go, and go guided and not have to worry about all the scouting and preparation and all of that, that's all taken care of for them at an incredibly affordable yearly price. So it's that's uh, awesome. People I'm who glad see it, man, the light bulb, for you. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't let you go without asking about uh, your elk calls. Um, obviously, you have your external calls with the trophy wife and with the matriarch, um, and then your diaphragm calls. Um, you've got you know several different diaphragm calls. 
you said that the elk in unit one, some days they, they were a little bit more tended to like the diaphragm, um, but then other elk would like the external. Um, talk a little bit about your line of calls and, and the hand that you have in designing you know, each of the calls and having your name on those calls and what that means to you. Yeah, absolutely, Jay. It's, it's been very wonderful to work with Rocky Mountain hunting calls for the past decade. Um, it's hard to believe it's been that long. Um, but what I like is they realize that I am very picky about the calls that I will use, and I am very picky about tone quality. So I am not a gimmick kind of person. Um, I feel like tone quality is king. And so, um, you know, basically with those open read calls, I'm looking for that sweet three-dimensional nasal quality that, that, that elk have. And, you know, fortunately we were able to dial that in on the matriarch and on the trophy wife. Both of those are external read calls. You and I have talked about those in the past, and I feel like the difference between the two, and you agree, I think, in fact, you said that the trophy wife has a little more of a bright sound, a little more pizzazz to it, um, whereas the matriarch is a little more medium tone, maybe a little more mellow, which comes in handy, especially with, if you're in close with, with elk. It just sounds a little, a little more dampened, if you will. Um, but both of them produce a lot of results. And then the three mouth reads that I have, um, you know, one is kind of a utility type call, uh, the closer. It is a, a double read with a cut in the second read. So, um, you know, it's a great bugling read right off the bat. But then once you blow on it a little bit and it breaks in a little bit, um, it becomes a real good cow calling read also. Um, so, you know, it's a great all-around read. And then the blue read is the challenge read. And I found myself, Jay, when I bugled this year, really going to that one. It just really hits that high, strong note that you're trying to get that even when you, I noticed when I was bugling on it, it was ringing my own ears. <laughs> and <laughs> I was good. thinking, that's huh, a good thing. When I'm six, yeah, when I'm 60 or 70 years old, maybe I'm going to be hard of hearing from my own bugling. And I would say to my hunter a couple of times during the hunt, I'd say, well, I can guarantee you one thing. We're going to hear something bugling today, even if it's just me. <laughs> so um, that blue challenge read is made, you know, really specifically the way it's stretched, the thickness of the latex, um, the, the palette plate, all of that involves to be a great bugling read. Um, and then the orange one, the estrus excited read, to me is just really um, right in the wheelhouse of that good cow calling sound. It has that nice, just medium cow tone that comes out of it. Um, I found that, you know, and if you put a little more tongue pressure on it, then you can move it into that higher, more excited note that reaches out there and echoes, and I've heard you cow call and move calls into that higher note, that really gets bulls to react. And sometimes when they're sluggish and really don't want to get going, if you start calling with that higher tone and it echoes, it seems to really get them. Yeah, I, for you know, sure. Um, I found that to be true in Unit 1. <laughs> you know, it's been fun watching Elk Camp TV and getting to hear you call. I mean, being partners for a long time and then getting to elk hunt a lot together. I miss that, but I, I get to see that on the Elk Camp TV and get to see and hear, mainly hear is what, um, what I really miss is hearing those quality sounds. Um, obviously, you're right in the middle of the season and you have your Colorado, which you'll probably film a bunch of those hunts. How do you feel like this season filming Elk Camp TV compared to last season, you know, as far as progress, and then I'll let you go because I know you're busy. Oh, no worries, Jay. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, you know, definitely this year has been a trying year as far as that goes, but I feel like we were very blessed in the end on both of the hunts, you know, to have multiple interactions along the way on the archery and the muzzleloader hunt, you know, with call-ins along the way. So people will inje definitely enjoy those hunts. Um, you know, in comparison, Colorado is not quite as much calling going to be involved because of the fact that we're dealing with a larger herd of elk that's all grouped up. And in general, um, I don't call quite as much in that situation. Um, but, yeah, I just felt like this year I had to work extra hard 
for the encounters that we did did have. Thankfully, the ones we did have were, were quality, and we got great footage. Um, Raymond, who's videoing with me this year, has been filming with me for three years now, so um, we kind of both know what each other are after and, um, you know, each other's style, and so I'm very proud of the job he, he does, and I know uh, these episodes are going to turn out very nicely for Season 2 of Elk Camp, Lord Willing, and um, I think the viewers will enjoy seeing them. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for uh, bringing us the recap of Arizona. I look forward to um, hearing how you guys do in Colorado. I want to give you a chance to let the listeners know how they can hear more about you, reach out to you, et cetera, with, with your TV show, with the elk calls, with uh, zero hunt fees and, and all of that. Uh, so would you please do that for me? I'll also link it yes. up in the show notes. Thank you, Jay. Um, absolutely. So first off, uh, for anything about Elk Camp TV airing on the Sportsman Channel, they can log on to Elk, elkcamptv.com, and we're going to be putting up some swag, you know, hats, T-shirts, that type of stuff. Um, actually, I'm pretty happy with the hats and T-shirts, how those turned out. So those will be up on the website here pretty soon at elkcamptv.com. Um, if your listeners would like to learn more about Zero Hunt Fees, they can log on to zerohuntfees.com. There's like three pages devoted to that program, uh, a lot of detail on that, and then they can reach out to me. There's a submission form at the end of the third page that they can send to me, and I'll get back to them. And then um, as far as the elk calls and just the guide service in general, they can also log on to chapelguideservice.com for that. And then on Instagram, um, they can find us at Elk Camp TV on Instagram. And we're I've enjoyed following that uh, Instagram page this uh, this fall. And uh, Steve, it's always great having you on. I really appreciate your friendship and appreciate the professionalism and in, in all that you do. And and thanks for coming on, spend a little time with us. I know you've been gone for a long time. I'm sure Barb will be happy to have you around for a few days and then kick you back out and head head off to to uh, the ranch in Colorado. So, um, buddy, God bless. I'll I'll catch you later. Thanks for spending time here. God bless you, Jay. Thanks so much. As as always, it was a pleasure to be on with you today. Thank you. All right, buddy. Take care. Knock knock down some big bulls over at Red Mesa. Okay, will do, and I'll keep enjoying your uh, Instagram at the hot six. Thank you. <laughs> All right, buddy. Take Bye. care.